This is a recording from a Unions Weekend 2010 at the University of Virginia, made possible by the Alumni Association. On June 5th, politics professor Larry Sabato provided a glimpse into his crystal ball to give a crowd of alumni insights into the upcoming congressional elections. I hope you all have had uh, a fun reunion. I look forward to it every year. It's great to reconnect with, uh, with old friends who come in and former students. And uh, This is my 32nd year on the faculty here at the university. I'm well into teaching the children of my first students. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm into the younger brothers and sisters at this point. And fingers crossed, I'll, I'll get the grandkids. I'm not sure it's going to happen, but you never know. Uh, but I hope you've had a great time. I certainly know some of our alumni had a great time. That's one of the advantages or disadvantages of living on the lawn. You had a great time through to about 5 a.m. So this is just a, this is something that I just like to offer. It's really out of my area of expertise. But I would like to offer this to you, and I hope that you'll remember it for your future reunions. For those of you who graduated more than five years ago, you no longer have the body for streaking. Okay, I'm sorry if no one's ever told you that. Just don't even think about it. Up to five years, it's okay. The five, fifth anniversary, that's fine. But beyond that, and, and I'm just not going to tell you how I know, but uh, you know, please keep that in mind. Well, look, I know you're here to, um, to uh, talk about politics, and in fact, uh, I have shortened greatly my usual uh, usual, we change it constantly because politics changes constantly, but I, I always show a PowerPoint to kind of generate some questions and discussion, but I've shortened it a lot so that we can spend more time on questions because uh, you wouldn't be here on a Sunday morning if you, uh, after last night, uh, nursing that hangover, which some of you have, though, by the way, the students today no longer drink. Uh, that's the major difference that I've seen. And that's, what, that's why they do better on the test course. You know, you hear this as an alum, you know, I'm an alumnus and, and faculty simultaneously, and it always irritates me when I hear uh, the powers that be say, the current students are, are the brightest ever. There's never been anything like it. The university is so much better than it was back in the old days and so on and so forth. The only difference was alcohol. See, we were, we were too soused to do well on many of those exams. We could have done just as well as the, as the kids today. I would like to say that in our defense. Um, and there are other differences. In fact, if anybody wants to ask me about some of the differences, because it's good and bad, uh, you know, when you span this, and I've really been associated with the University of Virginia for 40 years. I was kidding. Uh, how many of you were at the panel yesterday with uh, John Castine and Leonard Sandridge and, and others? That was, honest to God, that was the best panel I've ever moderated. They were so much fun, and who knew they were funny? I had no idea. You know, we were hoping, but you never know. Uh, but that, I learned a lot. I, I don't know about you, I learned a great deal. From what they said, all of, I was, that's the first time I'd ever heard the number 38,000 students uh, at the University of Virginia. I don't know how many of you drive the corner very often, but uh, you know, we're already too big for Charlottesville. Now, two things occurred to me. Either we're going to have to get our, our science departments working together on parallel universes. That may be one way to fit 38,000 students together. Or for those of you who watch the Sci-Fi Channel, we could have stacked a stacked city, you know, where you, you have uh, essentially the same city in about five uh, different uh, layers stacked on, one top of, on top of one another. But in any event, it was, it was a lot of fun uh, yesterday. But, you know, I, I was kidding them about uh, having been here so long. Uh, but I've been here, you know, off and on for 40 years, mainly on for 40 years. And uh, that's a long time, and I've seen a lot of changes here, good and bad. Um, and every institution has that, so we can, we can even talk about some of that if you want to. But as I say, I know you're mainly here to talk about politics, so we will, we will do that. I'm going to, my assistant, I think, Joe, is running the, the PowerPoint. By the way, Joe, I need a bottle of water if I can get one up here. No doubt Tom will charge me for it, um, but I'll have to give him the money afterwards. You know, he's like that. And he charges ridiculous sums for water. I mean, really, it's outrageous. I don't know if he's doing that. Are you getting this for free? Is this all free? Yeah, well, you know when your bill comes due. 
And I know you're expecting that. It usually comes in early December, sometimes November, or whatever. So just be ready. And by the way, I, my, my good friend over here, Joel Rubin, it, he came up. He was actually in the year, I think, behind me. Yeah, he came up and I said, isn't this your 50th? And uh, as a result, he's in a great mood and he's laughing at everything I say, including the non-funny parts. And I appreciate that, Joel, very, very much. Okay, let's, um, let's move to the first slide. And thank you so much. Wayne, Wayne Kozart, thank you so much. Here's to Wayne. Is there Jen in here, Wayne? All right. Wayne, you have a lot of fans. Okay. We all know what the situation is, and you always look at things historically because human beings tend to react the same way given the same stimuli. We're not all that different from our predecessors, predecessor voters. And uh, midterm elections are a special kind of election versus presidential, and actually midterms are divided into two, the first midterm of a new presidency and then the so-called sixth year uh, a midterm, the sixth year itch, which tends to have a major uh, turnover. Now, sometimes first year midterms could have a major turnover. Bill Clinton had the biggest since the beginning of the 20th century. You remember that was the year when the Republicans took over both, both houses in his first midterm election, but that's highly unusual. Most midterm elections have a small turnover, the first midterm. And the second midterm in the sixth year of a presidency has a big turnover for obvious reasons. People get tired of a president and the controversies build up and everybody's gotten upset about something or another. And that's an American's birthright to be able to whine and complain endlessly, even when a president can do nothing about the problems. Our rule is if it happened on his watch, he's responsible. So. You know, the BP oil spill, there you go. It's, it's really President Obama, he had no idea. He was deep sea diving, he cut the cord on that thing, and that's, that's how we got all this oil, in case you didn't know. But essentially, number one, midterm elections almost always result in a loss for the presidential party, for the White House party, because again, the people who were excited and thought that that, another one, Joel, thank you so much, you know. And this one does have gin in it, I know Joel. It's free too, thank you so much. Uh, this, um, the people who were excited and, and uh, you know, were into that hopey changey thing uh, back in 2008 have found out that there is no nirvana. No president can create nirvana. And certainly not in two years, actually not ever, but don't tell anybody because that would possibly depress voter turnout in the future. So uh, there's, a, there's a downside to being in office. You can't fulfill the expectations of your own supporters. Therefore, the turnout on your side tends to settle and decline. What about on the other side? Well, all their fears were valid. You know, you're, you're going to validate those fears because you're actually going to do some of what you said you were going to do which is what they didn't want you to do, which is why they voted for the opposing candidate. And so they're energized and their turnout goes up. And really that's what midterm elections are all about. It's about the differential turnout between the Democrats and the Republicans. And we can talk about the Tea Party, but the Tea Party is a subset mainly of the Republican Party. 82% of Tea Party people have, have pretty consistently voted Republicans their entire adult lives, 82%. And some of the remaining independents have also voted Republican frequently. So this is not a Democratic Party subset, it's a Republican Party subset. So regardless of what you read, we're still into Democrat versus Republican. Uh, the, uh, the turnout factor is most important one of all. Presidential election has a turnout now of about 62, 63%. Which, which is bad, but much better than it used to be. You know, in, uh, in 1996, uh, 1990, uh, uh, let's see, 1988, 1996, and in 2000, we had turnouts of 49 or 50 percent. In other words, half of the adults in the United States were not voting, for, even for president, and the turnouts were lower uh, below that. Well, 2004 and 2008 changed that. People got engaged in both 2004 and 2008 with different results, but they got engaged. And so we have 62, 63% turnout 
in presidential elections. Where is it in midterm elections? If we're lucky in November, it will be 40 percent. So in other words, you're losing 20, 22, 23 percent of the adults who showed up in 2008 who aren't going to be here at the polls in November. They aren't going to vote. Who are those people? Again, disproportionately, they are Democrats and Democratic-leaning independents. They're the ones who don't show up for these kinds of midterm elections. Now, the Republicans won't show up at the same rate they showed up at in 2008 either, but their turnout will fall less severely than Democratic turnout will fall. It's mainly going to be uh, young people who, who went over two to one for Obama in uh, 2008. They aren't going to be voting. You're not going to find them at the polls. They're busy. As one of them said to me last year in the gubernatorial contest, a leader in, this, in the Obama student movement, I said, uh, are you voting for governor? Virginia had a governor election last year. And he says, oh, I says, no, that's just governor. He says, I voted when it counted last year. And that's, that's the attitude when you're young. You know, look, don't bother me with these elections for governor and local legislators and city council members that just create 90% of the laws that actually run my lives. I can't be bothered. They're not important. You know, I, I'm busy. Don't, don't you people understand? I'm busy. And I only vote for president. Well, they'll change as they get older and figure out the whole system. Uh, but in any event, they're not going to be there. Uh, minority voters disproportionately drop off in midterm elections. So African Americans, 96 percent for Obama and the Democrats. Uh, Hispanics and Latinos, 66 uh, percent for Obama and the Democrats. Uh, Asian Americans in some places, sometimes Asian Americans have a higher turnout than other voters, but in some places, um, 62, 63 percent for Obama, disproportionately low turnouts. So all that benefits the opposition party. Now, issues matter too. Uh, you wouldn't know it from the press coverage because, uh, and I don't want to be too critical of the press, we probably have members of the press here. Uh, and I like some and I dislike others and I'm putting a list together for my posthumous book. Uh, <laughs> and the dislike list is a hell of a lot longer than the like list. I've been working with them for 40 years. Uh, so. In any event, they, they have to focus on the narrative of the moment. They, they focus on what's happened in the last 24 hours. And with the new system we have of instant news all the time, they focus on the news of the last 10 minutes to the exclusion of everything that's happened before in American history, much less in the last year. I always tell people, just go and count the number of times the words historic and unprecedented appear on the front page of a newspaper in a, in a given week. And there is no such thing. You know, it, it's a banner year in world history if you have two or three truly historic events in a calendar year. But you never know that from the press. And I understand they've got to sensationalize to get you to buy or watch or read the product. That's, that's just the way it is. So I get it, but most of what you read has nothing to do with why people vote or how they vote, what they consider. The basic fundamental conditions are what drive people to one party or the other. And always fundamental throughout American history, usually number one, except in times of war, uh, the economy. Now, often people think that unemployment is the key variable there, and it really isn't. Uh, the most important variable in understanding how people relate to the economy and how it affects their vote is uh, income uh, per capita or family income. Do they have more real income in their pocket to spend or not over the last year or the last two years? Depends on what their frame of reference is. If they have more money, they feel better about the governing party and they're more inclined to support the governing party. If they have less money, they're in a crabby mood and they're less inclined to support the governing party. It's really pretty simple because most people, unlike you, who are here incredibly on a Sunday morning to talk politics, most people don't care very much. 
And they, rel- they see the headlines here and, they, and they, they hear a little snippet on the radio driving to and from work or whatever. But mainly they know what the conditions are in their lives. So unemployment, does it matter? Well, it certainly matters to the enormous number of Americans who are unemployed. 9.7 right now, and it's, it's going to go up because once the census workers uh, are discharged in a couple of months, it's going to go up again. You know, could be over 10 by, by November. But that isn't, and the part-time unemployment is 17%, somewhere in that general vicinity. Sure, it matters to them. But to the rest, well, if there's an unemployed person in your immediate family, yes, it matters. If an unemployed person is not in your immediate family, and, you know, that's true for most people, that's not what drives your vote. Are you concerned about the unemployed? Yes, in a generalized way. But everybody in the end pretty much votes their self-interest. And their self-interest sometimes can be reflected partly as the national interest. But it's still a self-interest. And they interpret it that way. So unemployment, no. Look at the growth or the decline in, in real income. And frankly, this year, it's flat. So that tells you immediately trouble for the incumbent party. And the, who knows? I mean, people are talking about a double dip recession. I don't know. I'm not an economist. My other habits are also good. So I can't tell you what, what's going to happen there. Then you have connected to the economy this, uh, this uh, concern, which I think has touched just about everybody across the parties, regardless of their ideology, and especially if they have kids, or maybe if they're teachers and they see young people and they feel guilty as they, they look at them. Uh, this, this concern for debt and taxes and spending. Because it's a giant problem and everybody recognizes it. The problem is most, most of the people in power recognize it privately rather than publicly. Because if they say anything publicly about it, the logical question is what taxes are you going to raise and what programs are you going to cut? And to, to paraphrase the, the old boss from New Jersey, Frank Haig, who once said taxes is losers, I would say taxes and spending cuts is losers. They're both losers politically. I, a lot of you will say, I want to take the tough medicine. We've got to do the right thing. Well, and maybe you do mean it. I don't know, but you're the exception. Because the truth is, people don't want to even hear it, much less do it. And it's always, don't tax me, don't tax thee, tax that fellow behind the tree. Don't cut me, don't cut thee, cut that fellow behind the tree. And we've all got an enormous shot coming because that debt bomb's going to explode. We all know it. It's going to explode before the end of this decade. And it's going to cause the most painful kinds of reactions that we've seen in our lifetimes. It really is, because the, uh, the retirement age is going to have to go up substantially. You're not going to be able to draw Social Security nearly as early as you do right now. they are going to have to be much more substantial Medicaid cuts. they are going to have to be tax increases of various sorts to pay for things that we take for granted, like gas, the gas tax. I've never understood the opposition this intense opposition to gas tax increases, sorry, because it's a user fee, not even really a tax as much as it's a user fee, plus a third of it's paid by out-of-state drivers. You know, that's, that's kind of a real bonus, if you, unless you, know, you want to drive on potholed roads and all the rest of it. But nobody can seriously propose these things and get elected. But nonetheless, that's what's driving the Tea Party and I think concerns in both parties about the future, this, this gnawing feeling in our gut that things are not going to be as good in a generation or two as they have been. And there, there are a lot of reasons for believing that. I've thrown in the BP disaster, though I don't believe, other than in the Gulf states, that people will be voting on that issue. I mean, and because elections are about contrasts. See, nobody is going to be in favor of the BP spill that I know of. You know, there may be a few BP executives, but uh, we've already seen how well they've done in a PR sense. Uh, and you know, people blame the president, it's true, 
uh, why, again, I, I'm not fully, I don't completely get that, except he wasn't, he wasn't as angry as he was supposed to be, you know, and, and, you know, we used to make fun of Bill Clinton feeling our pain about everything, and now apparently we want our pain, a pain felt again, uh, and that's questionable when it's Bill Clinton. You didn't get that, and I'm glad you didn't. Um, or maybe you did, and it wasn't funny. All right. Health care, uh, on the Republican side, there's still a lot of anger about the health care reform plan. However, it's balanced by the fact that it did energize some Democrats, which it was designed to do. Uh, they were totally disengaged, and it did energize them to a certain degree. Still, I think the balance is on the Republican side for turnout this November, which is what this election is about. Then you have the great issue of populism. Both parties are playing it. I think this is much more of a democratic issue. Uh, Wall Street, the banks, keeping the big boys honest, Joel. These are things that um, uh, everybody remembers from the disaster of late 2008 and into 2009. And uh, maybe it's irrational, maybe it will be counterproductive, but we wanna get them. We wanna get them in various ways and the financial services bill does it, other things will do it. It will play well on the campaign trail. That, that uh, fundamental populism has been a part of our politics throughout most of American history. Then you always have the wild cards. You know, God forbid there should be uh, a successful terrorist act, you know, that we actually get a competent terrorist as opposed to the incompetent ones. Let's hope that we continue to draw upon the well of incompetent terrorists, but you can't count on that. Somebody may actually know how to put together a bomb. Uh, and then, you know, everything can change overnight. You never know what's gonna happen. Same with scandal, although, you know, we, we're in scandal overload. There are so many scandals, uh, I can't keep track of them all. I'm gonna have to create a separate web page just for the scandals. You know, the, and it may be separate web pages for financial scandals and sex scandals and you know, family scandals, you know, it's, there's so many of them, it's just hard to, hard to focus sometimes. But uh, while it doesn't necessarily affect the national election, it does affect individual elections, individual elections. And, you know, those of you who think, I'm in the, on the Republican side who are here, I, I, I know there's some of you who feel very, very strongly about the um, Sestak and Romanoff um, job offers, and you know, I'm just terribly sorry. That is garden variety politics. <laughs> it's always happened, and it always will. Uh, and you know, there's a law against everything. There's a, you know, every every kind of fun, and certainly patronage, is banned by the law someplace. You know, you just don't know the statute books as well as you want to. Uh, those are not serious issues. But I know, I know, people care because actually, on the way over here, I. I've been, I've been saying that, that this garden variety uh, politics, it, it's not going to have any impact. I got a wonderful email from somebody who had read my comments, and this, this was what it said. You Ivy League Rhodes commie slime. <laughs> Tell me one more time how they flushed you out of a commie sewer pipe. Okay, boy? So, this, this is, it's going in my, in my, I'm so proud of this. I, you know, I, as my staff can tell you, I get, I get literally hundreds and hundreds of these. I'm thinking about a book of nasty emails and snail mail because some of them are really, they're works of art and they deserve to be preserved. Um, many are contradictory, but that's okay. We are human beings are contradictory. Uh, okay, in any event, now, now, well, let me, let me be fair. The one legitimate part of the, criticism that Obama's getting is, like most presidents, he overpromised, and you know, there was this, there was this holier than thou attitude, and I've heard it so many times, you know, Jim, we, those of us who are older remember Jimmy Carter, I will never lie to you. You know, when the presidents stretch the truth daily, it's in the job description. Uh, Bill Clinton, this is my favorite, this is the greatest howler of all time, I will run the most ethical administration in history. Um, that, that is one to remember. And, and Republic, let's not forget, you talk about uh, overpromise and hypocrisy, let's not forget mission accomplished for a certain president. 
um, that we had recently. And then Obama, you know, where he wasn't going to have any corruption. All. The, the difference between some of you and me is I just laugh when I hear candidates say those kind of things. I can't imagine anybody takes it seriously, but apparently some people believe them. And we're going to have to educate them. Okay, let's get right to the predictions so we can get to your questions and uh, the House outlook. Now, uh, with the Republicans winning temporarily the Hawaii seat, not going to last, out in six months, uh, it's a, it's a two-thirds Democratic district. You had two Democrats running in an open election and, and one Republican, and that's how the Republican won with about 39% of the vote, six-month seat out in November. But it br temporarily brings it down to a gain of 39 seats for the Republicans to take control of the House. Where is it? Okay, uh, we have this site called the Crystal Ball uh, at the Center for Politics here, which is a, a public service. We, we do what some other agencies do. The difference is we provide it all for free. They charge thousands and thousands of dollars for their ratings to special interest groups. Now, uh, being that we provide it for free, we have a staff and we have to pay them, we welcome your voluntary contributions of a few pennies, of a few pennies, well, maybe hundreds of dollars, uh, toward the end of the year. Please make a note of that when, when you know, Tom Falders calls you and demands money, you know, in the, in the end of the year shakedown. You want to say, Tom, I'm only going to give if the money goes to the Center for Politics. Can you please repeat that with me? Tom, I'm only going to give if this money goes to the Center for Politics. I'll, I see I'm going to be cutting the staff based on the response that I got. But nonetheless, we're proud of the fact that we provide this to the public for free. And what we do is we have two different, we're the only agency that does it two different ways. The first way is we go state by state and district by district, analyzing each Senate race, each governor's race, each House race. And we try and see what are the conditions prevailing in those districts and those states that would produce the results? And it's, that's when you get into the dirty street-by-street -street politics and you find out what the skeletons are in the closet for the candidates that might come out you know, as a scandal during the campaign, what the party balance is, what the war chests look like, and all the usual measures of politics. By that accounting, we have Republicans picking up 32 seats. Now, that's a lot of seats. That will be a good election year for Republicans. You wouldn't know it by a terrible miscalculation being made by Newt Gingrich and John Boehner and other Republicans who have been quoted over and over again saying the minimum they'll pick up is 60 seats. It's really going to be 70 or 80 or John Boehner says over 100. No, no. Not a chance because of the way districts are drawn. You don't have that many competitive races. Now, it's really stupid. I mean, that's stupid with a capital S to, to set those kinds of expectations. Then when you win the election, it looks like you've lost. I just don't know what these people drink. It isn't the same kind of gin we have here at the University of Virginia. Okay, I'm getting better and better the more I have. So 32, plus 32. Now, we started in January of 2009, when the, uh, when the election cycle started, with a Republican gain of 10 to 12 seats. So you see how conditions have changed. We keep ratcheting up, ratcheting up, ratcheting up, and it's up to 32. Well, that's not far from the tipping point. I've got 39 down here, which is exactly the number needed to take over. How did we come up with that? One of our key contributors, senior writer for the Center for Politics, Alan Abramowitz, wonderful guy, he used to be at William and Mary, now down at, at Emory, has the most successful statistical regression analysis that projects elections, has been remarkably accurate in House elections in the past. And his, we couldn't believe it when we plugged in all the numbers based on the economy and presidential approval and certain statistical modeling factors such as the number of seats gained by the Democrats in the last two elections, which means there are a lot of vulnerable seats for the Democrats to lose to the Republicans. It came out at exactly 39, exactly 39. Now, it's early June, although the regression analysis 
has a stronger predictive value than the district by district. So I think it's going to be very close. It's straddling the 39. And events that occur between now and November will have an impact. I, I said BP uh, wasn't a factor as such, but it plays into presidential approval. Presidential approval right now, the average is 47, 48 uh, percent. That's, that's actually better than Reagan was in 1982, uh, much better than Clinton was in the, his disastrous midterm of 1994. Let's suppose, and we hope this doesn't happen, everybody I hope in the room, whatever your partisan affiliation, you hope it doesn't happen, but suppose those two alternate wells that are being drilled that are supposed to be finished in August, you know, some people have remembered that about three to five tropical storms and or hurricanes come into the Gulf in the middle of the summer. And you know, that just might slow the process down. I don't know why I think BP might be incompetent doing this or that they might not operate on schedule. I'm probably being too cynical here, but that could push the relief wells into September or October. Well, even if they fix it in August, you're going to have oil washing up for a couple of months. So that, that could lower the president's approval rating. Uh, if we have, start to have the beginnings of a double dip recession, that's going to lower presidential approval rating. So there are things that will happen that will, that will modulate and modify these projections. But what I'm saying is, what I can tell you in the beginning of June is, it's going to be a solid Republican year for the House of Representatives. I can't tell you the exact solidity of the Republican year, but it's going to be a solid Republican year. So go ahead, you've got my permission, go to Las Vegas, bet on the election, and the University of Virginia better get a quarter of it. I mean, and remember, you deduct that from your taxes. It really, you save money, you know, in the way that when you go out and buy things on sale, you save money. Uh, so I know you're all familiar with that, but we really mean it. Okay, now, let's go from the House to the Senate. And, of course, the Senate's always so much fun because you have so many wild characters involved. And we got a we got, uh, big primary day on Tuesday. And I'm, this is the biggest primary day of the year, June 8th. It's 11 states voting. Uh, I'm calling it, <clears throat> to go over the top, I'm calling it Super Duper Over the Top Tuesday. And that, if you want to use an acronym, it's SDOT. Sounds like a transportation agency. Okay? Uh, so SDOT is Tuesday, and, you know, we're going to know a lot more after Tuesday, but some of these things, I think, are, are kind of set. Now, my projection may be a little generous on the Republican side. They need 10 seats to take control. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Remember, they need 10 because Biden uh, breaks the tie in the Senate. The reason it's not going to happen is because of the seats that come up in 2010. Believe me, they wish, the, the Republicans wish the seats that are coming up in 2012 and 2014 were up this year. Only a third of the Senate comes up every two years. And it's not a random sample. Some years have bluer state combinations, some years have redder state combinations. This is a blue state combination, which means the Democrats have a lot of slack. They've got a buffer in many of these states. So it makes it much tougher to make big gains. Nonetheless, I think Republicans are going to gain five seats at a minimum. Well, they're at 59 now. Uh, excuse me, the Democrats are at 59. That means the Democrats would be brought down to 54. It could go. Uh, as low as 53. Now, we all know the Senate well enough to know that that means their utter chaos will reign in the Senate because minimal majorities can't govern the unruly Senate. It'll make it much tougher for President Obama to get much of anything that's controversial through. Just imagine if you have one of the conservative justices stepping down. This Elena Kagan thing is the most boring thing I've ever seen, uh, you know, in modern times for a Supreme Court appointment. And the fundamental reason is because it's a liberal replacing a liberal. You know, and it's hard to get people excited about that when it doesn't change the calculus on the court. Well, think what will happen if one of the conservatives steps down voluntarily or sometimes it actually happens involuntarily. Uh, and then you have 
a liberal replacing a conservative, all hell will break loose. And if you have 53, 54 Senate seats, good luck uh, in terms of, of finding a way to get to get a nominee through. You'd have to nominate, I think, a moderate, a, a real, maybe a former senator, somebody who's got personal ties that would carry uh, carry uh, him or her over. So uh, that's a pretty substantial gain. It will set the Republicans up for either 12 or 14, depending on the political conditions. 14, if Obama's reelected, 14 will be the sixth year itch. So you'll have a lot of turnover uh, to the Republicans in 2014. And I think they would take over the Senate at that point if they hadn't already done so. So individual races, uh, you can see there are a lot, there are a fair number of toss ups. There are, uh, there are a few that I think, you know, I've got um, Indiana, I think it'll go to Coates. He's certainly he's a weak candidate. I, I, that is incredible to me that a party would nominate somebody like Dan Quotes, a, a Coates in the year of the Tea Party. You know, a, and he only got 30, I think it was 38, 39% in the Republican primary, but he had split opposition. A DC lobbyist who was caught on tape saying he was looking forward to retiring in North Carolina. And they brought him back. His former senator has been out for years and years. Former senator brought back, and and now because he's the Republican running in Indiana, I guess he will he will win. I think Senator Burr in North Carolina will win a second term, which is incredible because that seat is turned over every six years like clockwork, like clockwork since 1974. Every six years, that was the John Edwards seat, as you you may remember, got to be a crowded seat for various reasons. Um, I guess that wasn't funny, but if you think about it enough, you know, it might become funny. Florida, oh God, I had, I had assumed, and maybe in the end Rubio will, will pull it together, but all the early polls show Chris winning. Not by much, you know, he's, he's a little under 40, but uh, we'll watch that one. It's either going to be Rubio or Chris. Meek is finishing dead third in that race. Uh, Arkansas, I will be surprised, I may be surprised, but I'll be surprised on Tuesday if Senator Blanche Lincoln is re-elected, uh, re-nominated. I think she'll probably lose even in the primary. But frankly, they're just fighting for the privilege of losing to Republican Congressman John Bozeman. That's the likely result uh, in November. That's a Republican seat. Notice I've got Nevada as a toss-up. Before, I mean, for six months I've had that leaning Republican. But the Republicans are getting ready to deliver on Tuesday to Harry Reid, the one candidate he, can pro he, he possibly can beat, the Tea Party candidate, who has got some really nutty positions. Now it's Nevada. Uh, so, you know, it might go through. I don't know. But this, this is a tough one. Um, this is where the Tea Party is hurting the Republicans. They're pushing the party further to the right, even in conservative states. And the other two Republican candidates are acceptable enough to win a general election. Sharon Angle, I don't know. It might happen. It might not happen. Uh, my guess is that Harry Reid's doing everything he can to get Sharon, uh, Sharon Angle nominated. That's how they play politics in Nevada. California, those of you from California will have two women heading the Republican ticket. Meg Whitman will win on Tuesday to uh, run for the uh, for governor and uh, Carly Fiorina, I think, will win the, the uh, Senate nomination in California. And, you know, on and on. We can talk about any of these races you want, but I've given you my bottom line, I think, plus, you know, I'm leaning more to five than seven now, given the kinds of things that are happening. And Mark Kirk in Illinois with the, the phony uh, award citation, I've been kidding that if Blumenthal, the Democrat who uh, who invented his Vietnam service, if he wins and Kirk, who invented the award, wins, they can have lunch in the Senate in January and Blumenthal can talk about his non-existent Vietnam service while Kirk shows off his non-existent medal. And that will be a very interesting lunch. Why do they do these things? I mean, it's so unnecessary. Blumenthal served in the Marine Reserves, which you know a lot of people didn't do during Vietnam. It's perfectly legitimate record. He didn't have to lie. Kirk was in the military. He's been in a lot of um, uh, war zones. He wasn't necessarily under fire, as we're finding out, but he had a perfectly legitimate, respectable military record. But he had to lie about it. He had to exaggerate about it. And I've told people, I've seen this. I'm glad we have an honor system. We have a lot less cheating here than in other places. But I have actually had, in 32 years, I have had absolutely guaranteed A students 
cheat to guarantee the A or to get an A plus. You know, totally unnecessary, but they did it. They did it and of course they paid for it. And it's a tragedy, it's, a, a ter it's something in human nature. I don't know what it is. And resume enhancement is a great example of that particular piece of the genome, I'm sorry to say. Okay, let's go to governors and then we're gonna go to your questions. I, I can't, I'm gonna wait for your questions about individual governorships. The Republicans are gonna pick up a big net here of six to seven, somewhere in that vicinity. Uh, they're, they're gonna pick up in places you wouldn't expect because it's time for a change, like Pennsylvania. Uh, I think that's a very likely Republican pickup because in modern times, every eight years, Pennsylvania's changed parties. They have a very legitimate outlook on politics, which I summarize in this old phrase. They believe in throwing the bums out and throwing a new set of bums in. And they do it with regularity. They, and that's how they check the two parties, both of which are corrupt in Pennsylvania. There's a lot, there's a great commonality uh, between the parties there, and I salute them for that. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, not really, I don't salute them for corruption, but uh, Michigan, Michigan is a substantially democratic state, but it's been in a one state depression for decades, essentially, and it's going Republican because people get mad and they say, hey, I gotta have a change, and they're gonna get a change. I think Wisconsin will go uh, Republican, that's closer. Iowa, I think, will definitely go Republican as long as the Republicans dominate former Governor Terry Branstad on Tuesday, and I think that will happen. Um, you know, some of the others we can talk about if you want. California probably will go Democratic in the end. Again, I I've got to be blunt. Uh, nobody wanted to run for Governor of California. That's how the Democrats ended up with Jerry Brown again. He's the unopposed Democratic nominee. The older people in the room remember Governor Moonbeam from his two terms in the 70s up until 80, end of 82. It's, it's incredible. He was the youngest governor of California. Now he's likely to be the oldest. And I don't know how you solve the problem there, except you know they're using experience and Meg Whitman has none. So that's refreshing to some people. You know, she's run a company and she's, <laughs> she's uh, already spent, this is just, this will blow your mind. As of last week, she had spent 69, million dollars out of her own pocket already, already, it's June, on the governorship, and she has told people privately she will spend between 150 and 200 million out of her own pocket to be governor of California. That will make it close, but in California, despite Schwarzenegger, who's at 19%, he won't be back. He's at 19%. Uh, you know, if, if you want to, how many Californians do we have? There's an excellent magazine, National Journal, very wonky, but they have a cover story on the hopelessness of California, the ungovernable state uh, this week. You really should read it. I mean, it is depressing. The, the, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who came in, you know, supposedly going to cut the budget and get things back into order. Well, when he got in, the structural budget deficit was nine billion a year, which is a lot for a state. Now it's 20 billion a year. And this is, a, this is the guy who was supposed to fix it. So it's, it's an ungovernable state. It's, it's a perfect example, I'm afraid, of where the United States is going as a whole. Californians will not accept the cuts and the tax increases necessary to get their system back together. They just won't accept it. And here we go, here we go, and it could be national. So anyway, we can talk about these. Now I wanna say, look, if Jerry Brown wins California, with all due respect to South Dakota, it's a wonderful state, North Dakota and Montana and Idaho and so on, California is worth six to seven other states. So I don't know, what, I don't know how you call that, whether that's a, that's a good thing or a bad thing or a net even. Well, there are lots of exciting developments to come. That's an overview of what's going to happen. I would caution you as I conclude in suggesting, as so many people do, that the results of any given midterm election mean a thing about the coming presidential election. They almost never do, just like the presidential doesn't determine the midterm election. So don't draw that line between two data points. 
because I can guarantee you so much will happen between now and 2012, we'll have a completely new world on which to judge the eventual party nominees. Let me stop here and take some questions. I think we have until we have about, well, when does this end? I've forgotten. No, it doesn't end at noon. So, so anyway, we've got some time for questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, you've got to get a you got to get a mic so we all can hear you. Yes, sir. Uh, it was a very nice talk. I enjoyed Thank it. you. But well, I would like to hear your take on what the immigration issue had to do with this last election with prominent Republican spokesmen talking about round up the illegals and send them back, close the borders, and this rhetoric with this growing Hispanic uh, segment of our electorate. Uh, I'd like to hear a comment from an authority on that issue. I think that's why Republicans lost the election. All right. Well, he's not here, but I'm going to give you an answer. Uh, look, it, this, is a, this is a contrast between short-term gain and long-term pain. Uh, the great tragedy for the Republicans and the country is that the Bush-McCain plan wasn't passed in 2007. All right? Uh, I know it's, it's now against the law to say anything good about George W. Bush, but this was one good thing he proposed, and McCain too. It was a reasonable compromise in 2007 that would actually have resolved some of the basic points, I think a lot of the basic points, of the immigration debate. Nobody would be 100% happy. Some of you in here probably grumbling, say it was awful. No, well, it was better than the alternatives it was, that we're seeing right now. And it would have happened early enough to have an impact. We could have done something about the problem then, given where the economy was. And tragically, it was torpedoed by liberal Democrats who didn't want Bush to have a victory, and conservative Republicans who were so anti-immigrant they were blinded to their own interests. So you had this, these two ships passing in the night and we beat that program uh, in Congress, tragically. And now we're stuck. The Republicans forgot what happened in California with Governor Pete Wilson, who gained temporarily by running an anti-immigrant campaign in the early 90s. You know, it, it worked. He got reelected based on it, but the long-term impact was disastrous for Republicans in California. The um, Hispanic Latino population in California went from voting Republican in some elections and usually 40-some percent for Republicans. Now it's 70-30 in California. The Hispanic Latino population in California is so large it's deadly. It has converted California into a 60-40 Democratic state. Good luck to the two Republicans being nominated on Tuesday. That's the, that's the price they're, they're paying. It's going to happen nationally. Temporarily, and we've seen it in Arizona, it's having a positive effect for some Republicans. It may get Jan Brewer re-elected governor. She was the underdog. She succeeded Janet Napolitano without an election. So. It may get her reelected. It may help McCain because now, as you know, he wants to build the dang fence. Uh, I think is the way the phrase goes. You know, he's switched on immigration and everything else, and he's no longer a maverick. Never said he was a maverick, except we have about 47 pieces of videotape. Uh, but as you know, videotape lies. Uh, that's what they tell you anyway. Uh, so I think it's a disaster long term for Republicans. They need to come together on a compromise, but they had that opportunity in 07 and blew it. Is that Charlie back there? Charlie Glazer, who was our ambassador to El Salvador during the Bush administration. Thank you, Larry. Uh, I have uh, two questions. With the Republicans seemingly running against Pelosi, who has approval ratings in the low 20s, versus Obama, who has approval ratings in the mid-40s. Number one, do you think that's a good strategy, and will it be effective? And then number two, uh, things change between now and November. What could change that would help Obama and the Democrats? 
Okay, Charlie. First question on Pelosi. Uh, I think it's a fundamental strategic error, or maybe I should say fundamental tactical error by the Republicans to run against Pelosi. And we just proved it in Pennsylvania 12, the special election uh, at the Pennsylvania primary, which was in um, a district vacated by a deceased Democrat that had, was the only district in the country to switch from John Kerry, the Democrat in 2004, to George W, uh, to uh, John McCain in 2008. It was a district moving to the Republicans in the toughest possible year for Republicans in 2008. It's a hard scrabble, heavily white district, ripe for Republican takeover. They should have won it easily, easily. And if they're gonna get even 39 seats, it makes you wonder. It really makes you wonder. And they lost it. They lost it overwhelmingly to uh, the Democrats, uh, the dead Democrats' chief of staff, who could have been linked to all the Washington problems and all the rest of it. How did it happen? For some reason that I don't understand, they decided to run the campaign against Nancy Pelosi. Yes, she has low ratings, and let me tell you why it doesn't matter. Because a large percentage of Americans don't know who she is, and second, those who do and may have a negative impression of her don't really care. That, what does that have to do with their dinner table concerns? What does it have to do? Now, those of you who are Republican activists, you would say, why she's ramming these horrible programs in that it's gonna destroy the country. You, you take, it takes you five minutes to explain that to an individual voter, okay? You don't have five minutes, again, because they don't care enough, all right? So it's a terrible tactic. It is driven by those Washington, D.C. consultants that bedevil both parties who believe that everything that happens in their tiny little beltway orbit matters to the rest of the country. And because they all know Nancy Pelosi, they think everybody else does. Now, what could change? Look, uh, again, I'm not an economist, as I told you. I'm surprised constantly by the by the economic statistics that flood out from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and other agencies. And you know what? So are the economists. Can you remember a week when their predictions came true? And they're all, they have the same people on that night explaining the meaning of the new statistics that they claimed wouldn't exist the night before. You know, that's a, a great, I've got to get into that profession. I'm held accountable for election uh, predictions, but they're never held accountable for economic predictions. So despite their claim that the economy may be going into a double-dip recession, who knows? Things could turn up. There are loads of reasons why the global economy could improve rather than deteriorate. So that is one thing that could change things. And I mentioned terrorism. You know, sometimes when a president takes charge, as we saw with 9-11, we've seen it in other situations, including the Oklahoma City bombing for Bill Clinton, it has a positive impact for a president. There are political impacts from tragedies. So a lot of real development could change things. Let me get one over here. Yes, sir. You may breathe for the moment. No, you cannot project. You um, can't. And it's great to see you, Delegate. It's right to see you. Yeah. The, the, the thing that struck me about the map that you put up were the number of gubernatorial switches that are going to take place. And of course, we're going to redistrict. Uh, and has the center done any work on what that's going to mean for the next, because that'll set the district line for the next 10 years for the congressional districts? Yes. Delegate Fralin, former Delegate Fralin now, unfortunately he got out. He was one of the good ones and he was a UVA graduate. And I think I taught you, right? Didn't I teach you? Okay. Well, though, I noticed there were several votes you made that were mistakes. You would not have made them had you been in my class. But anyway, yeah, 10 of them. Okay. He, uh, he was a great member of the House of Delegates and, and uh, you know, tragically, this is totally off subject, we, we have so few UVA graduates in the General Assembly. We used to dominate the legislature and we don't anymore. We have hardly anybody. And you better believe it matters. I mean, that is one reason why the funding levels, you know, when, when I was here, people around my, I think the class 73 is here, the year before I graduated, 
when we were here, 33% of the money uh, to run the university came from the state. I see Gordon Burris out there uh, saying, yes, that's true. And today, I believe it's six, right, Gordon? Going down, 6% from the state. And they call us a state university, as we always say. We get 6% of the funding and 100% of the regulations. I wish, <laughs> why, why wouldn't we go private? As, as one senior one senior legislator said to me, he's not from UVA, I won't, I won't quote him directly, but he said, um, he says, I'm, I'm totally in favor of that. I think you all should. Just come up with the six billion for the lawn and rotunda. We'll sell it to you. Six billion just for the lawn and rotunda. So that's why we're not going private, no matter how much you might want to do that. Uh, what the heck was your question? Oh, redistricting, okay. Anyway, I wish some of you would run. I wish we could get more UVA people in there in both parties, so that whoever's in charge, we would win. We would win because I'm seeing so many inferior universities, Virginia Tech, getting money that they shouldn't get, Virginia Tech. And it's just wrong, Blacksburg. I don't like to see it. And I try to stay away from fingering individual institutions, Virginia Tech. Uh, I just think it's so wrong to do that. Okay, and I could have mentioned many others, but I hate them. <laughs> so I have tenure, I don't care, I can say things like that. Uh, now, uh, getting to redistricting. All right, let me take it from the national level first. Um, we're going to see the same thing we've seen every 10 years since 1960, a transfer of seats in the House of Representatives from the Frost Belt, the Northeast and the Midwest, to the Sun Belt the South and the Western states. There are a few exceptions. Louisiana's losing one because of Katrina. Uh, I think that's really about the only exception. But Texas is gaining four seats. Uh, Arizona, at least two. Uh, California, this is fascinating. I'm sorry to my Californians over here. For the first time since you became a state and, and were applied to the 1850 census, first time ever, you're not gaining multiple seats. You're not even gaining one seat. You'll be lucky to hold your delegation. You could lose a seat for the first time ever, but you may stay even. Now, you'll still be gargantuan, but uh, that tells you what's happening. People are voting with their feet. They are disproportionately leaving California, and they're going to the interior west states that are gaining seats. Now, what does that mean? It has two completely separate meanings. One is for the Electoral College. As I add up the transfer of votes and what it means in how the states lean, the Republicans are going to gain somewhere between 6 and 10 electoral votes. You know, well, in a close election like 2000, that's the election. Um, of course, if it's Obama's margin, you know, 365, when you only need 270 to win, obviously it's not going to make a difference. So we don't, we don't know. But it, it's better to gain electoral votes than to lose them. Ohio is losing two, for example. Now. Uh, the second effect is completely different. That's at the state level. Where do you see the transfer? It's from rural areas, which are heavily Republican-leaning, to urban-suburban areas, which are substantially Democratic. For Texas is a great example. Those four electoral votes are automatically Republican. Just put them in the Republican column for 2012. However, at the state level, at least two, and maybe three of the four seats will go to Hispanic districts electing Democratic representatives. So, uh, and, and the same is true for state legislatures. Uh, just because you're, you're a Republican state gaining electoral votes, let's say, uh, and even in Virginia you're not gaining an electoral vote, you're staying even, the, uh, the transfer of population is to the exurbs and to a lesser degree the suburbs. Well. Now, the exurbs can go either way. It depends on the kind of candidates nominated by the two parties and the year, what the issues are of the year. But the problem for Republicans in the exurbs is these are highly educated, high-income voters. They are very responsive to the social issues with the opposite effect. That is, they're the non, they, they may be Christian, but they're not social conservatives and they don't like the social conservative emphasis. 
uh, in the Republican Party, so they tend to vote Democratic. This is, this is a big change. They used to vote heavily Republican on fiscal issues. Now they're switching because of social issues. So as I say, I think there are two very different effects. You have to look at each state uh, and you have to look at it regionally. Yes. Let me get you a mic here. These young people are working hard. I hope you're being paid. Is Tom Folders paying you? Or is this volunteer? I figures. Ask him for some gift from this. He's got tons of, he's got a whole storeroom full of junk. Okay, you need to get something. Yes. How do you think, how do you think the uh, Tea Party movement's gonna affect the Republican conservative parties in the long run? Well, well, you know, the long run, we're all dead, including the Tea Party. Um, and look, American history is dotted with these movements on left and right. And they only have one thing in common. They don't last. They, they either die out or they merge with one of the two major parties. Does it have to happen again exactly the same way? No, but that's where I'd put my money for the long run, okay, or even the medium run. For the short term, they're having two very different effects. In some places, they've energized a lot of new people, transferring that energy into the Republican Party, helping them in November. In other places, because frankly, they're not very practical, and, and they don't like practicality in politics, uh, and they're so anti-incumbent, they're hurting the Republican Party's chances. Uh, uh, you know, this, we're in a congressional district where that may be true, where they may split the November vote, refusing to coalesce around the nominee. I'm going to be interested to see down there in, in Norfolk whether that happens as well. I mentioned Nevada uh, with Sharon Angle. You saw what happened in Kentucky with Rand Paul. I suspect Paul will win anyway because he's the Republican in Kentucky in a Republican year. Remember, that was, that was a 57% McCain state. So probably a win, but I tell you one thing, his opponent, Trey Grayson, would have won in a landslide if he'd been the Republican nominee. Rand Paul, it's going to be, you know, 53-47, 52-48. The Republicans have to spend money in, uh, in Kentucky. And Rand Paul, you know, son of Ron Paul, he's one of those candidates, and I've known many of them in both parties, where if you could just send them to Bermuda for the general election, they would get a higher percentage than if they campaign. That's where the problem comes in, when people get to know them. Uh, but they're stuck with him. They're stuck. It's going to be really interesting to see that Republican caucus. You know, his, his seatmate will be Mitch McConnell, and he's already said he may not support Mitch McConnell for Republican leader. That doesn't build ties. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's what, that's what people want. So it's very mixed. It's a, and I think you have to look district by district, state by state. Don't forget New York 23 last November. The Tea Party deprived the Republicans of a seat they absolutely would have gotten in New York. House seat, U.S. House seat. So we'll see. Let me get one. All right, here we go. Joel. Joel Rubin. Joel Rubin, great TV guy, now doing PR work. He's open for business. And I've taught... So I, I've, I've taught your son and your, and your daughter. Oh, 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 oh. Is it on? Yes. You, you mentioned our, our primary. We have a primary in the second district in yes. Virginia this time. Yeah. And the guy that's ahead right now in the polls has put five hundred dollars to $800,000 of his own money into the race. He's spending more than all the other five candidates combined. And you mentioned Meg Whitman out in California and what she's putting in. Is this a good or a bad trend in your view? In, in politics, the self, sort of self-financing. I'm sure the parties love a candidate who can bring all of his own money into it. Looking back throughout American history, is it good? Are they insulated from all the lobbyists and the corruption money because they're so rich, or is that not a good thing? Well, Joel, uh, you know, I think they, you know, they're people like everybody else, and they they understand the pain of people who are having to sell their third and fourth houses in their second yacht. They get it. This is not easy. Uh, you know, everybody has to downsize. So, look, uh, I'm kidding, you know, partly. Uh, I, I would say this. Uh, the, you're absolutely right. The parties recruit these self-funders because it means they can save their money and spend them in other districts and states. They recruit them. 
And uh, you can also make an argument that you can't be corrupted by spending your own money. And it, it's a First Amendment right. If that's what you want to spend your money on, that's what you spend your money on, all right? At the same time, uh, you know, I don't really think they do understand the struggles that average Americans face. Now, this applies to the Kennedys and the Rockefellers and others, too, you know, and all across the parties. Uh, that's not to say they can't do good things. The Kennedys and Rockefellers are examples, and, and there are many others that we could cite in both parties. Uh, so it's a mixed bag. I'm, I am concerned, though, that, uh, that we've, we've gotten to the point, we're rapidly getting to the point where not only can't average people run, but you can't even have most of the elites running because they don't have the money to support their, their habit. They, they can't, they can't uh, get out there and, and get elected. And I, you know, that is not a good thing. Do we want an oligarchy? Is that where we're, are we moving back to an oligarchy? They used to, you know, an oligarchy used to run America. Goodness knows it ran Virginia. Is that what we want? I hope not. I, it does concern me. You know, the, the price of admission anymore in politics is, is a couple million dollars out of your bank account. Even for a house seat, you have to spend a lot of your own personal money. Well, that really restricts the candidate field. All right, let me get somebody. Yes, ma'am. We need a, boy, she's really getting a workout this morning. Um, my question really dovetails with Joel's and what you've been talking about. What impact do you think the recent Supreme Court decision on corporate giving may, will make in the midterm elections and going forward? Right. You all remember this controversial decision, uh, which basically says that corporations as entities can spend unlimited sums uh, to advertise prior to elections uh, and so on. Look, will there be the occasional corporation that does that? Yes. Is it going to be widespread? Not a chance. Uh, corporations aren't going to invite that kind of scrutiny and controversy. Um, it causes problems with shareholders. Many corporations internally are divided. They, they may be two-thirds Republican, but they're one-third Democrat at the, at the top layer. It causes arguments you know, within the organization. They're satisfied and happy with the PAC system. You know, they, they're, they keep their hand in it. They play in the system. They don't dominate the system. Uh, I think it's going to have much less impact, at least for this year, than anybody thinks, or that you would believe reading the hyperventilating accounts that were in the newspaper. Maybe I'll be proved wrong, but I think that's going to be the case this year. Let me get one way in the back. Uh, there are two of you. I'll get both of you, since you're, that will help our young people running microphones. When does this end, by the way? I don't know. 11.30? Okay, I will cut, cut it at 11.30. Promise. I know you've got to get on the road. So uh, this is a media and politics uh, question, Mr. Sabato. Yes, um, there was a January 2010 survey, uh, public policy polling did, that had Fox News as the most trusted news network. 49% said they trusted it, 37 didn't. It was the only news network that had a net positive rating, driven by 74% of Republicans uh, trust. Wow, uh, fewer than 20% uh, of Republicans trusted any other network. Um, flip that at by, sorry, but that. I'm getting cut off. Um, if you look at it's the MSNBC, <laughs> they're cutting you off. <laughs> it, they, a, a different organization, Pew, in 2008, did a survey of current events and how knowledgeable people were. And uh, Fox News regular viewers came in next to the bottom, and at the very tippy top were regular viewers of Jon Stewart and Stephen Colbert. Um, That's scary. So, so with MSNBC now trying to be sort of the liberal answer to Fox News, are we going to see more media that's driven by, I'm going to tune in to the people who reinforce my belief, um, and is, are we ever going to get another Walter Cronkite? Well, you got it exactly right. Uh, we, we live in an age, and I, I, you know, I try and balance things to the degree humanly possible, and I'm human, I don't always succeed, and 
goofed, but I, I try and come back, you know, to some kind of balance in the middle, and I try to say this side thinks this, and the other side thinks that, and then people, I, I try to have respect for people. They can make up their own minds. People aren't stupid. They, they're not, if they're watching a news channel, they certainly aren't stupid. I mean, I'm sorry, they're, uh, they could be watching, you know, the other 380 channels, uh, you know, that have washing machines going around and fish tanks and all the other things that you can watch on TV. So you have to have respect for the people who are watching. But I certainly see and feel the wrath of people who only want to hear what they already believe. And there are, in my view, equal numbers on left and right. They don't want to be confused with contrary facts. Don't give me the facts. Give me the opinions I already agree with. And that's why you have this, you know, Fox, MSNBC bipolarization there and CNN dropping like a rock. You know, CNN has tried. Now, they, I think they certainly during the Clinton years, you know, they were called the Clinton News Network. They, they leaned more to the Clinton side. But on the whole, you will get both sides more in the same hour on CNN uh, with, uh, at least on the news shows. You know, I'm not talking about Larry King necessarily. I, I'm not sure about Larry King. I haven't watched in years and apparently no one else has. Uh, but I wish him well with whatever wife he's on now. Uh, <clears throat> But look, um, the long and short of it is, I hope we can get back. I hope we can get back for our sake as a country to listening to other people and their views, civilly, disagreeing mildly or strongly, but respectfully. I certainly know that's true with, with our University of Virginia alumni. Uh, we, we all have many vigorous political conversations I have with a lot of you over the years. And we don't always agree, but who cares? I mean, the fun is in the debate. Uh, so I wish we had more of that. Well, will there ever be another Walter Cronkite? Some people liked him, some people didn't. Um, but if you're talking about a news anchor who dominates and draws disproportionately the American people to watch an evening newscast, the answer is no. No, we have, uh, some would say disintegrated, Others would say decentralized our news. We no longer have a common national conversation on the evening news shows. Maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing, but it's gone forever. It's absolutely gone forever. You know, you once had, um, you had uh, back in the 60s and 70s with a far smaller American population, you had 55 plus million people watching one of the three major networks evening news shows that ran from 6.30 to 7. So, you know, you had to get home from work to have that TV dinner, uh, you know, watching, watching one of the news shows. And, you know, frankly, they were it was all delivered by white males giving five stories in approximately the same order with the same take. No matter which which network you tuned into. So that was a downside of it. 55 million. Do you know what it is today? The, the three together, Diane Sawyer, our alumnus Katie Couric, and, and uh, Brian Williams, the three of them together are around 20 million and falling. Now, 20 million is a lot of people, but we've got 300 and I think it's going to be somewhere around 306, 307 million Americans. So it just means a lot of people aren't getting their news in the way they used to. But you have the internet, they get snatches of this and that. You've got the news channels, you've got a few million watching, and really that's all it amounts to. It's a few million people watching those news channels. Um, there, there's no sense to crying it because it's, it's here to stay. Now, let me get another question or two in that general region. Good morning, Larry. Good morning. I don't want to be loud on this again. Um, Last year I came to this and I asked you about my old roommate, Ken Cuccinelli, and his chances of becoming Attorney General, and I want to put you on the spot again. Um, at the risk of getting uh, your academic paper subpoenaed, I'd like to know what your, what your thoughts are about his, what, what, I, what I would consider extreme views over the next, over the rest of his term, how they'll affect Virginia and how they'll affect his relationship with the governor. 
Well, I did, in fact, uh, teach Ken Cuccinelli. <clears throat> he didn't learn a thing. Um, <laughs> sorry, William. Uh, no, I, let me say this for Ken. He is, he's a principled guy. He will tell you exactly what he believes, and he'll follow through on it, which a lot of politicians won't. And I give him, I give him credit for that. Uh, he doesn't, uh, doesn't hide his views. But, uh, you know, is he out of the mainstream in Virginia? You know, is the Pope German? This is a very moderate state. I'm sorry, I know this state very, very well. I know it precinct by precinct. So don't tell me what the state is. It is a very moderate state. Ken is way to the right. Now, how did he win? He won a landslide. He won because he could have walked down a street anywhere in Virginia, and no one would have come up to him. Nobody knows who's, who these candidates are running for attorney general, or for that matter, lieutenant governor. They're completely anonymous. And so people vote for governor, and they tend to, not always, but they tend to stick with a ticket. We only elect three people in Virginia. So you, you tend to get a ticket. Occasionally you'll get one of the other party. We actually got two of the other party in 2005, but there are always exceptions to the rule. That's how Ken got in. Now, he's in. And I think we're all going to learn just how long four years really is. <laughs> and knowing Ken, if this is the only office he ever serves in, he'll still be taking legal actions on the morning before his successor is sworn in. Um, uh, and, and that's just the way it is. So I would say, and look, there are plenty of people on the, uh, who've been too far to the left, who have, not, who have been too far to the left for Virginia or for any given state. They're, not repre they're representing their party and their own ideology rather than the broader interests of the state. I would simply remind all of you, whatever your ideologies and parties, elections matter. And when people don't pay attention and when they don't research and look into the details on candidates and where they stand and what they stand for, there are problems. Problems develop. So there you go. To be, on, to be honest, that's my, that's my view of Ken. I remember him as a student. He lived on the lawn. Um, he had very strong views about the University of Virginia, and they were not terribly positive. So that put him in a certain category for me. Now, what else do we have? Any other questions? Yes. Since we're doing personalities, last fall you were a little dismissive of Eric Cantor and his possibilities nationally. And I wonder how you feel about Mitch Daniels and Paul Ryan. Well, uh, Vince Daniels? Vince? Oh, Mitch Daniels, absolutely, okay. Well, no, I wasn't dismissive of Eric Cantor. I'm simply saying, if he, you know, Eric you know, has good sense. And I think he wants to stay, and he should stay, in the House and try to become Speaker. He's, he's built a career in the House. I don't see why you would abandon that and, and run for statewide office, say governor, which it's a one four year term, non-renewable. Or Senate, you start out as a freshman, be a long time before you have any influence there. And national, no. I mean, it, 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 it's just, it's not gonna happen. So his future is in the House. That's all I was trying to say. I wasn't being dismissive of him. Now, as far as uh, Paul Ryan, I think the sky's the limit. He is very able. He's a Republican congressman from, from Wisconsin who has, in my view, one of the best deficit reduction programs out there. I don't agree with every part of it. You won't agree with every part of it. But he's tackled the tough issues. I mean, he actually looked at what needs to be done to reduce our structural debt before the debt bomb explodes. He deserves credit for that. So I give him a lot of credit, and, and he's, a, he's a good media candidate. Now, he's got to get elected statewide office. See, he's not in the situation Eric Cantor's in. He needs to run. He's refused repeated entreaties to run for the Senate or governor. He needs to get elected statewide, and then the sky's the limit for him. Mitch Daniels I've known for a long time. Mitch Daniels I've known for a long time, governor of Indiana. And he's finishing up his second term in 2012. There are a lot of Republicans who are really dissatisfied with their field. They want somebody who has proven in an executive office that he can govern and govern well. 
And I think uh, Mitch Daniel is, is one, if he wanted to run. Now, is he a media candidate? Absolutely not. Does he have the fire in the belly? I don't think so, which is why I doubt he actually does it. But he would be a competent president were he elected. Let me take, let's see, we got time for maybe one more, and then I'll let you hit the roads. We're losing our audience. I recognize this from the classroom, except in the classroom they simply fall asleep. Here they leave. Yeah. Could you talk just a little bit about why climate change, environment, and energy are not at the top of the list or on your list? Could you talk just a little bit about that? Well, I had BP. You know, sometimes an event encapsulates an issue. And BP has put energy and climate back on the agenda. You know, ideally, and I would hope 100% of us agree on this, I hope so, because presidents of both parties, both parties have been preaching it since Nixon. Every single one of them says we have, as we do, an addiction to foreign oil. It's contrary to our national interest. It has cost us again and again and again and again, and we do, we do almost nothing about it. We do almost nothing about it. And that's the tragedy. And every time something like this happens, we say, could this be the moment when we'll finally take it seriously and do something about it? Hope springs eternal. That's all I can tell you. Let me take, let me take one more, I hope on a light subject. Yes. Let's finish with a laugh. Energy is depressing, sir. Very depressing. I can now go home happy. Good. <laughs> um, what, what do you think about the Chris Christie phenomenon in New Jersey? And do you think that the rest of the country is going to look at how he tackles some of the state's um, issues and see potentially maybe a way that we as a country should be looking at things? Yeah, no, I like Chris Christie. I've watched him and, and uh, I, tell you, I tell you how he sold me. And I think he sold a lot of other people. You, you can agree or disagree with his policies. I'm not talking about his policies. I just like him personally, the way he projects. And goodness knows New Jersey needs, sorry, a cleanup. And so do a lot of other uh, states in terms of corruption. And, and it's, it's in my unholy trinity of corruption. Uh, New Jersey, Louisiana, and Illinois. And I know there are a lot of other contenders. New York has been trying to break in for years. And I think, I think it will succeed eventually. And, you know, there are other places. But uh, as, far as, um, as far as Chris Christie's concerned, it's when he said, uh, and he really meant it, you're stuck with me for four years. I don't care if I'm reelected. I'm going to try and clean this state up. Uh, and, and I'm not going to cater to the legislative interests uh, that uh, often freeze policy in New Jersey, the interest groups in New Jersey, the, the fractionalized politics in New Jersey uh, reminds me, frankly, of California. It's California in waiting in terms of its finances. It's becoming that way. New York has serious problems there, too. And you need someone like Christie at least to try to break this up. It's like a, an icebreaker moving through the uh, frozen over ice in the, in the Arctic. You, you, and I don't know how far he'll go. He may get stuck. He may not be able to do it, but at least he's, he's trying. Now, you know, there are some Republicans pushing him for president. I will believe he's running when he loses 100 pounds. That's, uh, that's the way you can always tell. When a politician, you probably don't know Chris Christie. Chris Christie weighs, was it 420? I think I'm exaggerating, but it's somewhere, oh, it's somewhere close to 400 pounds, I think. You know, he's, he's massive. So to be a national candidate, right or wrong, you know, he's going to have to lose some weight. Um, sometimes it signals ambition. You know, if you're Bill Clinton or John Edwards, it means you're dating again. Uh, but I always, I look for these physical signals, you know, as to whether... People are, are gaining or losing weight as to, you know, how much ambition they have and what their, what their love life is like. Uh, look, as always, we've had a great time. It's, I, I hope you know I, we're family, and that's why I speak so frankly to you, because I know you will never use it against me. And, and if you do, well, I'm Italian. You're asking. I've got my Uncle Vito still alive. Don't, don't challenge me. But uh, I always enjoy it, and I've learned over the years, it's the alumni who come back to reunions are the ones who love the University of Virginia. And uh, we are in it together. 
and I hope we always will be, and I hope you'll always care the way you do now about your university. Thanks so much. Larry, thank you very much. Larry and I have this running joke about his uh, sartorial splendor. You'll notice his tie is, has a blue stripe, but it has a pink stripe as well. So we're trying to do something to help Larry out. Once again, thank you very much. <laughs>